Hi, my name is Doug Jensen, and welcome to my masterclass on the Sony PXW FS5. As you already know, the FS5 is the latest model in Sony's ever-expanding Super 35mm camcorder product line, which also includes the F55, the F5, the FS700, and the very popular FS7. With the FS5, Sony has taken most of their latest technological advances and rolled them into a compact grab-and-go camera that is ideally suited for documentary production, reality TV, breaking news, and event videography. Now, although Sony is positioning the FS7 as a baby brother or cousin to the FS7, that's not at all how I would characterize it. The FS5 is not a shrunken down FS7. In fact, the FS5 and the FS7 have practically nothing at all in common except for their shape. There are dozens of major differences between the cameras, and those differences range from having totally different menu systems all the way to the available choices for shooting modes. To be honest, when I pick up the FS5, it feels a lot like my old EX1 that has been given a bigger sensor, 4K codecs, and a removable lens. So finally, we've got a large sensor video camera that can be used for high-end broadcast work as efficiently as a small handycam, without all the shortcomings and compromises of shooting with a DSLR. If ever there was a camera that could straddle the full spectrum from novice to professional and everything in between, this is it. For example, if you want full manual control of things such as exposure, focus, audio, and white balance, you've got all of that with no compromises. But if you want a mix of manual and automatic control on a setting-by-setting -setting basis, you can do that too. It even has a full auto mode that makes operating the FS5 almost foolproof for novices. I can't think of any other big sensor cameras that offer that kind of flexibility. Weighing in at just under 2 pounds, the FS5 is also a great choice for use with gimbals, smaller steadicams, and even drones. But that's not all. You also get super slow motion at up to 240 frames per second in full HD, advanced S-Log gamma modes, and 14 stops of dynamic range. But like any camera, there are some compromises that need to be acknowledged right up front. As I said before, the FS5 is not just an FS7 that has been shrunken down to a smaller size. There are significant differences between the cameras. Compared to the FS7, the FS5 lacks a few features that may or may not be important to you. There's no Cine EI shooting mode, no LUTs, no timecode in or out connectors, no Genlock, no picture cache, no shot duration counter, no full-size 4K DCI formats, 4K UHD is limited to a maximum of 30 frames per second. 4K is only 8-bit. Slow motion over 60 frames per second can only be recorded in short bursts. There are no XAVC-I codecs. There are no XDCAM or MPEG HD422 codecs. You can't insert shot marks or clip flags. There's only one SDI output connector. You can't use the SDI and HDMI output simultaneously. It only has two channels of audio. You can't control how audio is mixed in your headphones. There's no eyepiece or loop for the LCD monitor. There's no way to set up custom clip naming. Clip names cannot be displayed in the viewfinder. You can't build your own custom user menu. You can't import custom user gammas. There's no way to export or import individual picture profiles. There's no way to use VLOC batteries. There are far fewer menus for customizing the performance of the auto exposure and auto white balance modes. There's no way to override autofocus on the fly. There's no autofocus confirmation indicator in the viewfinder. No shockless gain or shockless white balance. No dedicated buttons for zebra or peaking. There's only one zebra. The zebra function is type 1 instead of type 2. Peaking is colored instead of the better edge enhanced type. There's no waveform monitor. It has far fewer options for markers and no user box marker. No clear scan shutter mode. No special memory card slot for storing and moving user generated data files in and out of the camera. No external playback buttons on the body. None of the Cine gammas provide 800% dynamic range like Hyper Gamma 7 and 8 on the FS7. And finally, the FS5 has far fewer paint menus for customizing the look of the camera's picture, and the menus that it does have are completely different than the FS7. Of course, on the flip side, the FS5 has a lower price, is about half the size and weight of the FS7, offers better ergonomics for handheld shooting, powers up and is ready to roll in about 5 seconds, 
uses less expensive memory cards, is simpler to set up and operate, has an amazing variable neutral density filter function, has center scan crop mode, has a better focus magnification mode, can record frame accurate low res proxy files internally, can transfer full resolution or proxy clips via FTP, and it can stream live video via Ethernet or Wi-Fi. My point with these lists is not to say that one camera is better than the other, but just to emphasize that the FS5 and the FS7 are two totally different cameras that are designed to meet totally different needs. One is not better than the other, but I think it is totally wrong to label the FS5 as simply a shrunken down FS7. However, the purpose of this video is not to spend time comparing the FS5 to other cameras, and I promise to avoid doing that as much as I can. For the remainder of this training video, I'm going to assume that you've already chosen the FS5 and now you simply want to learn to use it as quickly as possible. If that's the case, great, because the goal of this workshop is to help you flatten the learning curve and save you a lot of time mastering your new camera. No matter what your professional background is, I'm confident this video will help you get a handle on the FS5's codec options, paint menus, high frame rate recording modes, S-Log gamma curves, white balance options, exposure tools, and dozens of other important features and functions. First off, I need to point out that the information presented in this video is based on firmware version 1.1. However, by the time you're watching this video, your camera might be running a newer version of the firmware, and that may result in some slight differences between your camera's menus and the ones you'll see me using today. Sony is well known for frequently releasing firmware updates for their cameras to improve performance, fix bugs, and to add new features and functions that you might not have even expected when you bought the camera. And I think that's great, but the downside is that it's impossible for me to update this video to keep pace with every little firmware change. In some cases, I can anticipate what firmware changes are likely to be made, so I'll point those out as we go along. But I'm sure there will be many more that I did not expect, so please be on the lookout for differences between our cameras and adjust how you use your camera accordingly. There are many things that make the FS5 better than other cameras in this price range, but let's begin with the sensor. The FS5 Super 35mm sensor is the same one that's used in Sony's more expensive FS7 and F5. These three cameras are very different in most ways, but at their core, they do share the same sensor. Super 35 is the industry standard sensor size for motion picture production and is enormous in comparison to regular HD camcorders. And what does that mean to you? Well, the biggest advantage is that a large sensor can help you get shallower depth of field, thus giving you a range of creative options that isn't possible with cameras that have smaller sensors. The image quality of the FS5 is stunning for such a small and inexpensive camera. I would say that in most shooting situations, there is very little visual difference between the image quality of the FS5 and the FS7. Of course, to ensure excellent results, that bigger sensor must be used in conjunction with the right lenses, menu settings, and shooting techniques. Otherwise, there's no advantage at all to having a bigger sensor. Contrary to what some people think, a big sensor does not automatically ensure cinematic looking video with shallow depth of field. We'll talk more about all of those things in depth as we go through this masterclass. Another advantage is that the sensor is designed specifically for shooting video, not stills. This means that compared to DSLRs and many other 4K cameras, it has minimal image skew and very low levels of rolling shutter, and that is a huge advantage. Not only does the FS5 have a big sensor, there are also more photo sites on the sensor, with four times the resolution of normal 1080p high definition video cameras. And to make things even better, the FS5 can capture 4K UHD clips using Sony's new XAVC codec that requires a fraction of the storage space that RAW formats or ProRes files require. Of course, I could very easily go on and on listing all the benefits and highlights of the FS5, but why waste your valuable time doing that? This video is not meant to be a new product review, nor is it a shopping guide or camera shootout. And this video wasn't thrown together after I spent just a few hours with a loaner camera. I actually purchased my own FS5 and most of the accessories and lenses that I'll be talking about. I've spent weeks testing, experimenting, evaluating, and kicking the tires of the FS5 so that I can share my findings with you. So what I want to do next is take a quick tour around the whole camcorder to get familiar with the external buttons and controls, and then we'll take a more detailed look at all of them in later chapters. I'm also going to assume, unless I say otherwise, that you have this Sony lens mounted on your camera. 
As you probably know, the FS5 can be purchased as a body-only model or as a bundle package that includes this 18 to 105 millimeter zoom lens. It features servo zoom control, optical steady shot, a constant f4 aperture, autofocus, auto iris, and it has pretty decent image quality. You may or may not have decided to buy this lens with your camera, but since it is the official kit lens, I'm going to assume that you have one, because many of the functions and settings that we'll be talking about will work differently or won't be available at all if you're using a different lens. Now there are so many different compatible lenses and lens adapters that can be used on the FS5 that it would get really tedious to stop and point out every time a certain function only works with certain lenses. So just to have a level playing field, I'm going to assume that the stock 18 to 105 kit lens is on your camera. And if you don't have this lens on your camera, then I'll leave it up to you to identify whether a certain function, such as autofocus or steady shot, is available or not. And speaking of lenses, a great feature of the FS5, and maybe one of the reasons you bought it, is the ability to change lenses, so you can choose the precise type of lens that best suits your subject, shooting style, and budget. To remove a lens from the camera, you just press the lens release button all the way in, rotate the lens counterclockwise until it stops, and then pull it off. The native lens mount of the FS5 is called the Sony E-mount, and it's the same mount that's used on Sony's FS7, FS100, FS700, A7S, and other cameras in the NEX product line. But you're not limited to just using Sony lenses. A big advantage of Sony's E-mount is that it has a very short flange focal depth, and that makes it easy for you to use almost any 35mm SLR or cinema lens that you can lay your hands on, provided you've got the right adapter. Adapters are available for Canon, Nikon, PL, and many other types of lenses. Since many adapters merely serve as a mechanical dock and don't actually have any glass in them, they won't cause any loss of light or diminished optical performance. We'll talk more about lenses and lens adapters, including the use of focal reducers, or speed boosters as some people call them, in Chapter 15. The layout of the camera's controls should feel familiar to anyone who has used other Sony professional camcorders. The switches and knobs are logically laid out right where you'd expect them to be. But one of the most unusual features of the FS5 is the smart grip, so let's go there next. It's obvious that handheld shooting, not to be confused with shoulder mount shooting, must have been at the forefront of the designer's minds. The basic idea of the smart grip is a carryover from the FS7, but on the FS5, the grip attaches directly to the camera body so it's positioned close to the camera's center of gravity, thus making it very easy to hold the camera steady and maneuver it smoothly in tight spaces. My only real complaint about the grip is that there's too much play in the mount. I'd be happier if the connection didn't make noise or wobble when the camera is moved. A big advantage that the FS5 has over the FS7 is that the grip doesn't extend below the camera body, so the camera can be easily set down on a flat surface without toppling over. And since there's no extension arm jutting out to get in the way, the FS5 is much easier to pack in a small bag or backpack. If you need a camera that can come out of the bag and be powered up and ready to roll in less than 5 seconds, you can't beat the FS5. When you press the release button, the grip can be rotated and locked into a wide range of positions. There are eight possible positions and having that amount of flexibility is something you'll really appreciate after a long day of handheld shooting. Of course, the smart grip can be detached completely from the camera by pressing the grip release button down here. It's kind of hard to see. And then rotating the grip clockwise until it comes loose. When the grip and top handle are taken off the camera body, the slimmed down FS5 is perfect for use on gimbals, small steady cams, drones, or in compact underwater housings. With the grip removed, you can also add a standard airy rosette, not supplied with the camera but available from Sony as an accessory, to attach the smart grip and extension arm from an FS7 or any other arms or attachments that use the airy rosette standard. Before you reattach the grip, make sure that the link cable is already plugged in. And then, in basically the same way that you'd mount a lens on the camera, line up the white index mark on the grip with the index mark on the camera, slide the grip into the collar, and then rotate it counterclockwise until it locks into place. The smart grip is much more than just an accessory for making handheld shooting more comfortable. It's actually an integral part of the camera's design and offers several other important functions that can make shooting easier. Let's take a closer look. 
First, we find the multi-selector joystick control, which offers an alternative and better way, in my opinion, of navigating through the camera's menus and making changes. We'll be talking a lot more about the things you can do with the multi-selector as we proceed through the rest of the training. Just above the multi-selector, you'll find a record stop-start button. This is probably the most important button on the grip because it makes starting and stopping recording during handheld shooting so simple. Next, we find a button with a 5 printed on it. The number 5 tells us that this is assigned button number 5. Assigned buttons are a standard Sony camcorder feature that have been around for several years, so you probably already understand their purpose, but just in case you're not familiar with them, I'll explain anyway. Basically, the FS5 has six assigned buttons scattered around various locations on the camera body and the grip. Each one of them can be customized to instantly activate any one of 32 functions that you get to choose. That way you can easily turn your most frequently used settings on or off at the touch of a button without having to scroll through layers of menus. Some of the functions that can be given to an assigned button include such things as steady shot, the camera center scan shooting mode, and one touch playback of the last clip you shot. Any one of the six assigned buttons can be programmed for any of the 32 available functions, but most of them have a factory default setting. In the case of assigned button number five, it's pre-programmed to activate the camera's direct menu. So that brings up the logical question, what the heck is the direct menu? Well, the easiest way to explain it is to demonstrate it. Watch what happens when I press the assigned button. A white underlying cursor is displayed beneath the settings that can be quickly changed via the direct menu. If a setting is underlined in orange, that indicates that it's selected and ready to be changed. I can change the selected setting by pressing the multi-selector joystick one way or another. For example, right now we see the orange cursor is located under the shutter speed setting. So if I want to change the shutter speed, I press in on the center of the multi-selector, and then use the joystick to lower or raise the shutter speed. When I find the speed I want, I can lock it in by pressing in on the center of the multi-selector. And that will also exit me out of the direct menu mode so I can return to shooting. So what settings can be changed via the direct menu? Well, technically there are seven settings that can be changed, but depending on the camera's current configuration and the type of lens that's being used, very seldom will changing all of those seven functions be possible at the same time. Nevertheless, the seven settings are shutter speed, white balance, auto exposure compensation, focus, the variable ND filter value, iris, and gain. The idea behind the direct menu is to provide a quick way of changing settings during handheld shooting without taking your eyes off the viewfinder. But let me point out that most of the functions that can be changed with the direct menu also have dedicated controls elsewhere on the camera that are actually easier to use than the direct menu. For example, if we want to change the gain, I can simply flip the switch right here and I'm done. As with many controls on the camera, there is often more than one way of turning a function on or off or adjusting its value. And as you get more experience with the camera, you'll need to decide for yourself what methods work best for you. On top of the grip, you'll find a zoom rocker switch for use with compatible zoom lenses. And here's a cool thing about the FS5, even when you don't have a compatible zoom lens mounted on the camera, this switch can still be used to activate the clear image zoom function, which is Sony's proprietary name for what is usually called digital zoom on other cameras. Clear image zoom magnifies the image up to 2x when shooting HD or 1.5x when shooting 4K. And because it's digital, it can be activated with the zoom rocker switch even when you're not using a zoom lens. Sony claims that the technology they develop makes clear image zoom superior to the ordinary digital zoom you find on consumer cameras. So is it any good? Well, we'll put it to the test in chapter 15 and you can come to your own conclusions. Next to the zoom control, we find a sign button number four with the words focus mag stenciled next to it. So as we learned with assigned button number five, that means focus magnification is this button's default function. But since it's an assigned button, you've got the option of reprogramming it for any of the other 32 allowed functions. Pressing this button once will electronically magnify the center of the image in the viewfinder by 400%, thus making it easier to check the focus. Pressing it a second time will magnify the image 800%, and pressing it a third time will return the viewfinder to normal. 
Focus Mag works with all lenses and all shooting modes. In fact, you can even use focus magnification while you're recording because it's purely a monitoring function and it doesn't affect the image that's being recorded internally or what is being output by any of the video connectors. And unlike the FS7, you can use the multi-selector joystick to change which part of the image is being magnified. Swinging around to the front of the Smart Grip, we find the assign dial, which by default can be used to change the iris of a compatible lens. But as you may have guessed from its name, the assign dial can be reprogrammed for something else instead, such as changing the gain, focusing a compatible lens, or adjusting the variable ND filter. And the final control on the grip, hidden discreetly away on the inside, is assign button number 6. Notice that this assign button doesn't have a label next to it, and that's because it's the only one that doesn't have a default function. But you can choose whatever assignment you want from the 32 different options if you want to give it a function. I normally have a sign 6 on my camera programmed to turn steady shot on and off. And because the Smart Grip uses the industry standard link protocol, it's possible to use other third party link devices if you choose to. The final part of the grip that I want to point out is the strap that goes over the back of your hand during handheld shooting. For maximum control and comfort, make sure the strap is tight enough that it makes the camera fit like a glove. If you find the FS5 hard to shoot with handheld, chances are the problem is that you don't have the strap tight enough. After the Smart Grip, the next most prominent feature on the FS5 is the flip-out LCD monitor, which should not be confused with the OLED viewfinder at the rear of the camera. So just to be clear, this is the LCD monitor, and it would be incorrect to call it a viewfinder. The LCD panel has excellent picture quality and is exactly the same screen that's used on the FS7. Physically, the housing of the monitor is different, but the LCD screen itself is the same. In fact, you can use the FS7's LCD monitor on the FS5 if you wanted to because they both have the same connector on their cable. However, a big difference between the FS7 and the FS5 is that the FS5's LCD monitor lacks the optical loop attachment to turn it into a viewfinder. And unfortunately, the loop attachment from the FS7 won't fit on the FS5. In my opinion, this is a big oversight by Sony. I would love to be able to buy one of the FS7's optical loops as an accessory to put on my FS5, but it won't fit. I suspect that an enterprising third-party accessory manufacturer will probably come up with a solution, so I'll be keeping my eyes open for it. The monitor's cable is long enough that you can position the LCD in different places around the camera if you choose to. And to facilitate that, there are 9 quarter 20 threaded sockets spread out at various locations on the handle and camera body for attaching lights, monitors, microphone receivers, or any other accessories you might need. The threaded socket at the rear of the handle can be turned into a cold shoe instead by using the supplied hardware that was included with your camera. See page 25 of Sony's operation manual for instructions on how to install it. Now, although a GPS logo is displayed on the handle, GPS tracking doesn't actually work at the time I'm producing this video. Sony says it's a function that is planned for a future firmware update, so perhaps it will be working on your camera by the time you're watching this video. My FS7 is equipped with Sony's GPS system, so I'm already familiar with how it will work on the FS5 someday. Basically, the camera inserts special metadata into each clip to let you know exactly where it was shot. The GPS system is accurate to within about 20 feet and could be useful if you're shooting a documentary or working in government, industry, or anytime you need to know where you were when you shot certain clips. But like I said, GPS isn't working on the FS5 right now. At the other end of the handle, there's already an accessory shoe. But it's no ordinary shoe. This is called a multi-interface shoe. And what makes it so special is that it offers two-way communication with the camera. For example, smart devices such as Sony's UWP-D11 wireless microphone receiver can pass audio to the camera and get power from the camera without any wires, extra batteries, or cables. The microphone system literally becomes part of the camera rather than a cumbersome attached accessory. Fortunately, the convenience of the D11 system doesn't come at the expense of sound quality or build quality. The transmitter and receiver feature all metal construction, easy to read LCD displays, USB power charging, automatic channel scanning, infrared synchronization between transmitter and receiver, mic line switchable input on the transmitter, and true diversity with PLL synthesized tuning that virtually eliminates interference. Located just forward of the multi-interface shoe, you'll find the built-in microphone. 
As you've probably noticed, the FS5 doesn't come bundled with a shotgun microphone, but the internal mic is better than nothing for capturing scratch audio. And by scratch audio, I mean audio that can help with logging or editing, but isn't really intended to actually be used in a final production. For better audio quality, you'll want to attach a microphone to the camera's shotgun microphone mount. I own a number of different shotgun microphones from several manufacturers that I could use on the FS5, but the one I think works best is Sony's ECM MS2. I like the MS2 because it's small, lightweight, and delivers excellent stereo sound without breaking the bank. Just below the microphone mount is XLR input jack number two for attaching microphones, a sound mixer, or any other pro audio equipment. These input selection switches can be used to choose line level, mic level, or 48 volt phantom power. We'll talk more about audio recording in chapter 13. Next, we have another zoom rocker switch. With the factory default mode, the zoom speed is variable, meaning that the harder you press the switch, the faster the focal length changes. But if you'd rather have the zoom run at a constant speed, you can select that mode by changing one of the camera's menus. Plus, choose from eight different zoom speeds. We'll talk about those options in chapter 15. Next, we have another record start stop button. You can rotate the hold switch to prevent the button from being pushed accidentally. The entire handle can be easily removed from the FS5 without tools by loosening these two knobs. But be aware that without the handle, you lose the LCD monitor, one of the XLR audio inputs, the camera's built-in microphone, a record start-stop button, a zoom rocker switch, the shotgun microphone mount, and the camera's multi-interface shoe. Therefore, I highly recommend leaving the handle attached except in those rare instances when you really need to strip the camera down to the bare bones. Underneath the FS5, we find both quarter and 3 8 inch threads for rock solid attachment to tripods without any of the irritating twisting or rotating you can often get with cameras that use only one tripod screw. My favorite tripod to use with the FS5 is the Sackler FSB6. The particular package I own consists of the FSB6 fluid head, a Sackler Speedlock 4588 two stage carbon fiber tripod, mid level spreader, quick release plate, and a case. Even though the FSB6 has been around for a few years, it's as if Sackler designed it with the FS5 in mind. I love how lightweight it is, but more importantly, it offers frictionless fluid damping for extremely smooth panning and tilting that just isn't possible with other models in this price range. And the excellent counterbalancing system means I can take my hands off and the camera's not gonna drift up or down. As I travel around teaching workshops and doing consulting, I found that one of the most underappreciated factors in high-end video production is the importance of having a really nice tripod system. So if you're looking for an excellent tripod, I highly recommend you test drive a Sackler FSB6 and I'll bet you'll be blown away by the performance. As I mentioned earlier, the FS5 gives you two options for viewing what you're shooting. The LCD monitor up front or the viewfinder at the rear. But you can't use both of them at the same time. No matter what you do with the camera switches or menu options, you'll only see a picture on one or the other at any given time. Now compared to the viewfinders on previous Sony cameras such as the EX1 and F3, the viewfinder on the FS5 is a big step forward and has dramatically better image quality. One reason that it's better is because it's an organic LED screen, or OLED for short. An OLED display works without a backlight, thus it can display deep black levels, achieve higher contrast ratios, and can be thinner and lighter than a normal LCD viewfinder. Don't forget to take a few seconds to adjust the optics of the eyepiece by turning the diopter wheel so that the image in the viewfinder precisely matches your own unique eyesight. You have the option of attaching the larger eye cup that came with your camera to help block out ambient light, but I don't care for it myself because I have to squash my eyeball too deep into it to see the whole screen. Your experience might be different, so give it a try and see what you think. Unfortunately, all OLED screens suffer from a limited lifespan of the organic materials, so after a certain number of operational hours, and I can't say for sure how many hours, but probably in the hundreds at least, any OLED monitor or viewfinder won't perform as well as it did when it was brand new, and that goes for the FS5's viewfinder as well. Sony's solution to extend the lifespan of the viewfinder is twofold. First, the viewfinder is turned off by default. So if you want to use it, you must change the viewfinder LCD panel menu setting to auto. 
We'll talk in detail about the FS5's overall menu system in the next chapter, but in the meantime, just be aware that this is the menu you need to change in order to turn on the OLED viewfinder. With the menu set for LCD panel, the viewfinder is totally disabled and it can never be used. But if you change the setting to auto, then the viewfinder will automatically turn on whenever you look through it. So that's the second solution Sony devised to extend the lifespan. Automatically turn off the screen when you're not looking through it. Notice that there's a small sensor right here that will detect when your face is coming up to the viewfinder and then automatically turn it on. So just to be clear, with the auto setting, the viewfinder at the rear of the camera will remain turned off most of the time to extend its life but when the camera detects your face approaching, the LCD monitor up here will turn off and the viewfinder will turn on. Remember, only one or the other can be on at any given time, and that right there is one of the most irritating things about the camera. Why? Because the proximity sensor of the viewfinder is too easily fooled by anything that comes within about six inches of it, thus causing the LCD monitor to turn itself on and off at the worst possible moments as your hands, arm, chest, or anything else around the rear of the camera accidentally encroaches on that six inch zone that will trigger the LCD monitor to turn off. Now, I'm hoping maybe Sony will address this issue with a firmware update to make this less sensitive. In the meantime, you'll notice that the LCD monitor has an on-off switch on top of it. So if you only want to use the OLED viewfinder, you can turn off the LCD monitor right here. As a safety measure to make sure you don't lose function of both the viewfinder and the LCD at the same time, and thus have no way of seeing the camera's picture or the menus, the viewfinder will automatically become active whenever the LCD panel is switched off, or if the cable is disconnected, even if the viewfinder LCD panel menu is still set for LCD panel. In fact, this brings up a good workaround for dealing with the annoying issue of the LCD panel constantly turning off unexpectedly. First, I leave the viewfinder LCD panel menu set for LCD panel so the viewfinder won't come on automatically and thus interrupt video to the LCD panel. But when I do want to use the viewfinder, I slide the switch on the LCD panel to off and that makes the viewfinder become active regardless of the viewfinder LCD panel menu setting. It's not a perfect workaround, but it works better than the alternative. Underneath the LCD monitor, you'll find a mirror switch that can be used to flip the display up, down, or up, down, and left, right. But of course, this doesn't affect what is being recorded. With so many different ways to mount the LCD and rotate its orientation, this is a nice feature to have. Over here, we find the camera's primary record start stop button, which unfortunately doesn't have a built-in tally light on it. Next, the hold switch can be used to disable most of the buttons on the camera, thus preventing unintended changes from being made. We'll talk more about this switch and how it can be customized in Chapter 2. Next, we find the full auto button that provides an easy way to instantly change many of the camera's settings to automatic. Those settings are aperture, gain, shutter speed, and white balance. But please note that other camera functions, such as focus and audio levels, are not affected by this button. Over here, we find an essential component of any professional camcorder, and that is the neutral density filter knob. But I can guarantee you that the FS5's ND filter system works like no other camera you've ever used before. First of all, the FS5 offers you the choice of having a conventional ND filter knob with filters for clear plus three different density options. By default, the values are two stops for filter one, four stops for filter two, and six stops for filter three. But the amazing thing is that because the ND filters are being applied electronically, you can go into the menus and choose whatever density you want for each of the three positions of the knob. There are six options to choose from that range from two stops up to as much as seven stops. But that's not all. The FS5 also offers a continuously variable electronic mode that allows you to change the amount of ND filtering that is being applied as if you were turning the volume control on a speaker. Want it just a little darker? Then just turn the knob. This is truly an amazing advancement that I'm sure will become common on other cameras in the future. The ND filtering is applied smoothly with barely any visible steps and no detrimental effects to the picture quality or color. So imagine the freedom of being able to set your aperture, ISO, and shutter speed exactly how you want them and then just crank the ND filter up or down to account for different levels of light. This is a huge benefit that the FS5 has over other cameras. 
Just below the ND filter knob, we find a switch for selecting which of the two ND filter modes you want to use at any given time. But it's a little more complicated than just flipping a switch, so we'll wait until chapter 9 to explore the ND filter options in more detail. Below that switch, you'll find the ND iris dial and its corresponding switch. If the switch is in the ND position, then turning the dial may change the variable ND filter. And I say may because its function is dependent on other choices that must be made elsewhere on the camera. If the switch is in the iris position, then turning the dial may change the aperture of the lens. But once again, I say may because you must be using a compatible lens that actually offers iris control, plus certain other camera settings that we'll talk about later must also be configured to allow iris control. As you may have noticed, the Sony 18-105 kit lens that may have come with your camera doesn't have an iris ring, so the primary way to set the aperture manually is by turning the iris dial. But you could also use the assign dial on the smart grip if you've programmed it for that function, or even the direct menu method that we looked at a few minutes ago. To manually change the iris to a larger aperture, you spin the thumb wheel up, or roll it down to reduce the aperture. The iris button over here is just a simple on-off switch for auto iris. Or at least that's the case if you're using a lens that allows auto iris. Unfortunately, there's no indicator light on the button itself, so you have to look at the viewfinder display to determine if auto iris is activated or not. Anytime you see the little A icon next to any setting in the viewfinder, that means it's in the automatic mode. One method of activating auto iris momentarily is to use the push auto iris button. In some shooting configurations, when the camera is set for manual iris control and with certain lenses, you can press and hold down this button while the camera adjusts the exposure, and then release the button to lock in that exposure and return back to manual control. Over here, we find a similar pair of switches that deal with focus. The focus auto manual switch does just what the name implies, but of course, auto requires the use of a compatible lens. The push autofocus button will allow you to momentarily activate autofocus whenever the switch above it is in the manual position. And of course, when you've got a compatible lens. Up here in this area of the camera, we find assigned buttons number one, number two, and number three. Each of them has been labeled with their default setting. And as we discussed earlier, you can either leave the assigned buttons programmed for their default settings, or you can change them to something else that may suit your needs better. Button number one is assigned to let you quickly turn slow and quick motion on or off, so you don't have to go digging into the menus. In case you don't know already, S and Q motion is Sony's terminology for overcranking and undercranking the frame rate. The camera can shoot from one frame per second up to 960 frames per second internally. But there are a lot of limitations, gotchas, and caveats that need to be discussed, so we'll wait and cover S and Q motion in chapter 16. Assign button number two is pre-programmed to provide quick access to the camera's picture profile menus. So what's a picture profile? Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself because there's a whole chapter about this topic later, but briefly, picture profile settings can be used to store a number of parameters that determine the look of the camera's picture. Those settings include such things as gamma, knee, black levels, color saturation, and others. All of those parameters can be saved together as a picture profile, and there are nine custom picture profiles stored on board the camera. Assign button number three is pre-programmed to provide quick access to the camera's status screens, which are provided as a way to quickly view tons of information about the camera's current configuration without having to drill down into the menu system to look at individual menus. The Camera 7 status pages are a big time saver, and they're something you should get in the habit of using often. Unfortunately, none of the settings can be changed from the status pages. All you can do is look at them. The first status page is called Audio, and it shows you how some of the audio menus are configured, but more importantly, it displays audio meters that are several times larger than the default audio meters that are shown down in the right-hand corner of the viewfinder. Whenever you're setting critical audio levels manually, these are the meters you'll want to be looking at for maximum precision. To change to the next status page, you just roll the select set dial down or use the multi-selector joystick on the grip. Page two shows you at a glance how the camera's various video output connectors are configured. Page three shows the current function of the six assign buttons plus the programmable assign dial on the front of the smart grip. 
On page four, you can see information about the current value of the three programmable positions of the gain toggle switch, the three programmable ND filter values, the status of several white balance settings, and so forth. Page five shows you how the camera's three record buttons are programmed to function. For example, you could configure the camera so that pressing the record button on the side of the camera starts or stops recording on card A, but pressing the record button on the handle starts or stops recording on card B. Page six shows you the remaining capacity of the two memory cards. You'll notice that it doesn't give you a clear picture of the memory card's total capacity. It just gives you a number for use space and another number for free space. You've got to do the math yourself if you're wondering what size the cards are or how many hours or minutes you can keep recording. And finally, page seven provides some basic information about the remaining capacity of the battery. But all you get is a simple percentage. Unlike other Sony cameras, there's no indication of the battery's total capacity, how many hours or minutes you have left, how many times the battery has been recharged, or any other information. All you get is a percentage. Pressing the status button again clears the status display completely from the screen. In this area, we find some of the camera's audio recording controls. The FS5 has independent controls for each of the two audio channels, which can be recorded as high quality, 24-bit, 48 kilohertz uncompressed audio for excellent quality and fidelity. This pair of audio select switches allows you to decide whether the audio recording levels will be controlled automatically or manually. If you choose manual, then the recording levels can be adjusted with the rotary audio recording level knobs located right next to them. Next, we finally come to the power switch, which I hope is self-explanatory. Slide it to the left for shooting, slide it to the right to turn the camera off. Down here, we find the slot select button that allows you to designate which of the two memory cards are being used at any given time. Unless, of course, you're using the camera's simultaneous recording mode to record to both cards at once. It's good to know that with most of the recording formats, if one card fills up during recording, the camera will automatically switch to the other card without missing a single frame. That's called relay recording. In fact, you can even hot swap cards without interrupting the recording, so in theory, you could record nonstop forever. Speaking of memory cards, the camera's two memory card slots are hidden behind this door. The slots are known as A and B. And it's interesting to note that the two slots are not equal. Memory card slot A can accept a Memory Stick Pro Duo card, a Memory Stick Pro HG Duo card, or a normal SD card, but slot B can only accept SD cards. We'll talk about recommended types of cards, simultaneous recording, relay recording, and other card-related topics when we get to Chapter 8. Just below the two memory card slots, we find a USB jack that actually serves three purposes. First, you can connect the FS5 to a computer using an ordinary USB cable and use the camera as a very expensive memory card reader. But I suggest you save that function for emergencies only. SD card readers cost, what, less than 10 bucks, so why would you want to put wear and tear on the camera? Second, when the time comes to update the firmware on your camera, you must connect the FS5 to your computer using this connector in order to do the update. Unlike many other cameras, firmware updates are not installed from a memory card. The third use of the USB connector is to output good old fashioned composite audio and video to a monitor or some other device that has standard AV connectors. Remember RCA connectors? The required cable that goes from USB to AV is sold separately. Next, we come to the all important menu button that is used to access the camera's vast menu system and also the select set jog dial that allows you to scroll through the menu pages and make changes. You spin the dial to highlight the setting you want and then make a selection by pressing in on it. Anytime you want to play back clips that are stored on the memory cards, all you've got to do is press the thumbnail button and the playback mode is ready to go almost instantly. You can navigate through the clips to view metadata about each one or select a clip to begin playback. Next, the display button allows you to change how much on-screen information is superimposed in the viewfinder and on the LCD monitor. Although you can use the camera's display set menus to customize some of the information that's shown, the display button is handy for times when you quickly want to clear the screen of all the information. Over in this area of the camera, there are a number of very important controls for white balance and exposure. First, you'll find the ISO gain button that should not be confused with the ISO gain switch just below it. 
If you don't understand what ISO and gain are, don't worry, we'll discuss them later in the exposure chapter. But for now, all you need to know is that these settings control how sensitive the camera is to light. There are some important differences between the gain and ISO modes to know about, but we'll save that topic for later. The gain button allows you to toggle back and forth between manual gain control and automatic gain control. There's no indicator light on the button itself, so the only way you can be sure what gain mode you're using at any given time is to look at the viewfinder display. The little A icon next to the gain value indicates that automatic gain control is active. Whenever gain is set for manual control, the gain switch down here allows you to easily change how much gain is being applied to the video signal. The default values are 0 dB for L, plus 9 dB for M, and plus 18 dB for H. But each of those settings can be reprogrammed if you'd prefer to use different presets. The allowable values range from 0 dB up to plus 30 dB. Now just as this pair of buttons controls the gain value, this pair of buttons controls the white balance. First, there's the white balance button that is used to turn the automatic white balance function on or off. Once again, there's no indicator light on the button itself, so you have to look at the viewfinder display to see what's going on with the camera. But just to confuse you, this time the display is different than the other automatic controls. If nothing is shown in this area of the screen, then the white balance is set on automatic, and the camera is going to set the white balance all on its own according to however it senses the color temperature of the ambient lighting, just like how a consumer camcorder does it. Now watch what happens when the white balance button on the side of the camera is pressed. Now this icon tells us that the white balance is set on memory A. Note that the A seen here does not mean automatic, so don't let that confuse you. Memory A is just one of the three positions of the white balance memory switch. Whenever the white balance is not set for automatic, this switch is what controls the camera's white balance. As with any professional camcorder, you have the choice of using memory B, memory A, or preset. Another white balance related control can be found just around the corner on the front of the camera. This is the white balance set button that is used for executing a manual white balance. There's a lot more to say about white balance, so we'll skip over these controls right now and come back to them in chapter 11. But for now, please remember that if you do not see an icon here, the camera is running on automatic white balance, and that's something that you probably don't want to allow. Next, we have the shutter button that controls whether the shutter speed is being set automatically by the camera or manually by you. Once again, there's no light on the button, so you must check the viewfinder to see what's going on with the shutter speed. If the display has an A next to it, then the camera is controlling the shutter speed automatically. Now watch what happens when I press the shutter speed button. The entire shutter speed display becomes highlighted in a gray box. Whenever you see this box, that means that you can now manually adjust the shutter speed by spinning the select set dial up or down. Watch what happens when I spin the dial one way or the other. The number you see shown on the screen is the denominator of the shutter speed. For example, 250 would indicate a shutter speed of 1 250th, 60 would mean 1 60th, and so forth. The larger the number shown, the faster the shutter speed. You can adjust the shutter speed in steps that range from 1 2nd through 1 10,000th, but the particular choices available on your camera at any given time will depend on the video format and other settings that you've selected. When you see the shutter speed that you want to use, you can use the select set dial to lock in your choice. Notice that the gray box is gone now, and so is the little A that was next to the number when the automatic mode was turned on. To return to the automatic mode at any time, all you have to do is press the shutter speed switch a couple of times until you see the little A appear again. But I don't recommend the use of auto shutter, so I'm going to put the camera back on manual mode with a shutter speed of 1 60th. Moving to the back side of the camera, we find the rear tally light, which can be disabled using one of the system menus, if you don't want it to light up during recording. Unlike the FS7, you have independent control over the front and rear tally lights, so you can choose to have one without the other. Personally, I like to keep the front tally light turned off, so people I'm shooting don't know when I'm rolling, and the rear tally light enabled, so I can confirm that I'm rolling. Over here, we find the sensor for receiving signals from the supplied infrared remote control. Just below the door that protects the two card slots, we find the camera's headphone jack. 
If you don't have any headphones connected during playback, then audio will be output from the tiny little speaker right here. To power the camera from an external source, you can use the DCN connector located under this cover. Normally, you'll use this connector to get power from the supplied BCU1 AC adapter, which also does double duty as the battery charger. However, because the camera runs on standard 12 volt power, you can use practically any professional 12 volt battery or power supply that you may already own. But you'll need an adapter cable, which Sony doesn't make, however, Vortex Media does. The EXDC1 power cable allows you to easily power your camera from any professional 12 volt power source that has an XLR connector. The 6 foot cable has a standard 4 pin XLR connector at one end and Sony's special DC plug on the other end. Speaking of batteries, next we have the battery slot. Sony offers four batteries that are designed to fit the FS5 perfectly. The small BPU30, which came with your camera, the BPU60 with double the capacity of the U30, the BPU60T, which is identical to the regular U60, except that it adds a Hiroshi connector for powering compatible accessories, such as a wireless microphone receiver, and finally, the BPU90 with triple the capacity of the U30. These are the exact same batteries that are used on the FS7, EX1R, EX3, and F3. Sony currently offers two battery chargers, the BCU1 for charging a single battery, and the BCU2 which can charge two batteries at once, or charge one battery while simultaneously supplying 12 volt power to run the camcorder. Over here, arranged vertically, we find the SDI out connector, the HDMI out connector, and a wired LAN port. We'll talk more about the capabilities and limitations of the SDI and HDMI connectors in Chapter 18, but we won't be talking about the LAN port for the simple reason that setting up and troubleshooting live streaming and FTP transfers is extremely complicated, and I've chosen not to cover it at all in this masterclass. Next, we find XLR jack number one for attaching external microphones, a sound mixer, or any other pro audio equipment. The jack labeled remote is where you connect the cable from the smart grip, and the jack labeled LCD is where you connect the cable for the LCD monitor. And finally, the FS5 has an industry standard tape measure hook just in case you ever have the crazy urge to set your focus by physically measuring the distance to the subject instead of looking through the viewfinder. As I said earlier, it's clear that the FS5 is intended to be used as a grab-and-go camera for lightweight, handheld, run-and-gun shooting. And personally, I find the stock FS5 to be pretty comfortable for handheld shooting. And I see no reason to mess it up by adding a bunch of extra accessories that attempt to turn it into something that it was never intended to be. My advice is to keep the FS7 as lean and mean as you can, and only add accessories if you find they are really needed. One simple accessory that I never leave home without is my camera's storm jacket rain cover, which protects the FS5 not just from rain, but also from snow, sleet, dust, dirt, UV rays, and I'm sure someday it will even save it from the spray of champagne at a locker room celebration. The storm jacket I'm using here is a black medium pro, and it's the perfect size for short and medium length lenses. Large and extra large sizes are available for longer lenses. To use the storm jacket on the FS5, you can either remove the LCD monitor entirely from the camera, which takes just seconds and requires no tools, or you can simply rotate the screen out of the way and fold it against the side of the camera. Then the cover slips easily right over the camera in a few seconds. There's a bungee cord at one end that's cinched around the viewfinder, and another bungee cord at the other end that goes around the lens hood. Underneath the camera, there's a Velcro opening that allows your hand to reach inside and grab the smart grip or to facilitate mounting on a tripod. With the storm jacket snugly wrapped around the camera, you've got an affordable, hassle-free solution for protecting your camera that can be put on or taken off in about 10 seconds and stores in its own zippered carrying case. Another accessory I sometimes need is lens support. In the handheld configuration with a lightweight lens such as this Canon 24-105, the stock FS5 is perfect but I often use the camera for wildlife and other kinds of tripod shooting that demands the use of bigger, heavier lenses, and that's when the FS5 certainly needs some support. I don't think the E-mount collar on the camera can take more than a couple of pounds of weight before excessive flexing starts happening. Notice how much play there is when this red 300mm prime is wiggled up and down, and that kind of sagging is not good. 
If you're going to use heavy lenses, I highly recommend that you invest in some sort of a rod system so you can distribute the load properly. Here I have my camera mounted with a system from Hot Rod Cameras that I've owned for a number of years and have used with several cameras. But this is just one example of several ways that you can add lens support to the camera. And I haven't tested any other solutions myself, so I don't want to make any specific recommendations, but you do need some support if you're going to use heavy lenses. So that concludes our basic overview of the camera, and you should now have a pretty good understanding of the major features of the PXW FS5, plus a general sense of where the important buttons and controls are located. But what I haven't done is give you very much detail, and that's what's coming up in the next 20 chapters.